So um, thank you all for coming here today. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about a survey I did with some of my students. Uh, one of them is here today. Uh, if if um, there's any questions along those lines. Um, so one of the ways, uh, I've been teaching um, digital preservation for eight years now. Uh, at UCD, and um, one of the things we always do is digital creation tools, but what I found it really useful is to try to give students exposure to working professionals. There's a lot of ways you can do that. You can do long exposures like internships, you can do shadowing, you can do all of those things. During COVID, that got really difficult, right? Um, because you can't always go to some place. But we, you know, you all are working professionals and you have demands on your time. So I'm trying to figure out a way to give students that exposure to working professionals without sort of overburdening everyone who's already overburdened with everything. People want to participate, they want to help, but they may not always have time. Um, so one of the ways I figured out how to do that, and I tried doing that, is through uh, research projects where students work on a research project which puts them in contact with um, the community in, in a different way. So uh, this is in a module I t uh, teach and coordinate called Digital Curation Core Concepts. Um, we learn about the basics of digital preservation, digital curation. Um, we also do tool workshops, um, and those are led by Kieran O'Leary. Um, really important partnership because as an academic, I haven't worked in the library or archive for over a decade at this point. Um, Kieran is on the front lines working with these tools day to day and provides the students with an amazing experience um, and, and insight. And part of that is really talking about how learning how to use a tool, learning Python, is not just you sitting in front of a computer, it's co you know, collaborating with your colleagues, communicating with your colleagues, reaching out for help. Um, so part of my thinking that goes along with learning tools is figuring out how to get the answers you need if you don't have them. And, and that is figuring out the community you need to talk to, you want to talk to, you want to be a part of, uh, and reaching out to them. But it's also figuring out how to find the tool that's going to be the most useful. I can teach a student how to use a tool, um, and maybe that tool is not useful for wherever they go to work, or maybe it's not useful in five years, and I want their education to be useful years down the line. Um, so that's sort of the thinking that led to this. So with that, um, we sort of came up with this question um, that I posed to the students is how do, I'm stepping away from the mic, how do people find these tools? Um, you know, we know the tools are useful, we know there's communities around certain tools, but how, what happens when you're starting out? You're, maybe you just finished your degree, your training, you need to find something but you don't know what to do. Um, and this obviously helps the students think about what they might do when they go to work, so it gives them that future thinking about what they may do. But uh, it also helps me be a little bit more self-reflective on, on how I teach students. So uh, in general, this is like the super quick summary. There's 15, give or take, 15 plus years of literature on digital preservation education and tool development. So there's skills and competencies. We have a lot of that. We've seen that for a while. Um, there's case studies of using specific tools for a specific issue. A lot of that's in published literature. Maybe it's in conference proceedings, maybe it's on blog posts, maybe it's in listservs if we, you know, we still have listservs, right? Um, and then there's also how do we fit tools into our everyday work? And we're saying that a little bit more, um, you know, that's what I'm going to call tools in context. But what we don't see is what do you do when you need to find something you don't know where to start and you don't know where to go and you don't know where to look? Um, and then the second part of that, the secondary question, is how can these discovery patterns inform education and, and hopefully make it better? So this is where it gets a little, <laughs> a little hairy. Um, so I actually, uh, the class, I think the class had about 30 students last year, um, and there's two different research projects. So they're in teams of two to three or four to five, depending, and they're we're going to break this out, uh, this research project, into like the literature review, the methods, the data collection, the results. Um, and in each group of student is, uh, students is going to work on one of those sections. Um, there's going to be, they're going to work on their deliverables, but they're also going to be in charge of communicating with the other teams. So I spend a lot of time in the classroom saying, okay, work with your, work with your teams, but then make sure you know where this team is and this team is if you have to go ask this team about this. Because 
you know, you can't do all these things in isolation. If you're going to write appropriate methods, you have to know what the literature says. So you need to go talk to the literature review team. Um, and if you're going to do the data collection, you have to talk to the methods team to know how you're collecting the data. So it, that in, in and of itself is, is important because it builds community in, in the class and in the classroom. But it also um, it, it helps students develop skills on how they might find information, um, and particularly in the context of research. Um, so again, each team had a liaison to communicate with other teams, but also to communicate with me. So if there was, you know, an issue, and I would do these meetings of I'm meeting team A and team B and the representatives from this group and this group and this group. Um, so it is possible. It's a little, like I said, it's, it takes a lot of planning. Um, but then, you know, uh, what happens is, uh, you know, the, the data collection team will develop the data collection instrument. The data will be handed off to the analysis team who produced the results, and then I sort of bring everything together. I say to students, you know, and it's like, it's like the day before Christmas at this point, I'm like, who wants to write a paper? And they're out, like, usually, like, uh, done. So uh, I usually am the one who writes most of the paper, which is perfectly fine. So the survey questions that uh, the survey, the data collection group came up with, um, where they're asking about the frequency of tool use. And, and I will say, thank you if any of you in the room participated in this survey, because we couldn't do this without you. Um, so uh, they asked about primary source of information about tools, the features that were valued most, difficulty in discovering new tools, the priority of specific features, which tools were used regularly, and then the importance of two registries that the students decided to focus on. Um, I, we distilled it down to 13 questions, uh, so it wasn't overwhelming. Um, and uh, distributed on different um, online virtual networks. Um, and it was live for a two-week period in November. Uh, in total, we got 68 responses, which is pretty, pretty good for two weeks. Um, obviously, results are not generalizable with such a small uh, pop, uh, sample. Um, but the other thing was that it was really important to note that there's not a lot of overlap. So it's not like everybody who answered the survey was using the same tool. So just run through some results and then talk about what I think those results mean. So uh, how often do you use digital preservation tools was one of the first questions. Most people were in, in the daily or weekly. So the, these were frequent users who responded to the survey. Um, so then we kind of get into a little bit more detail about how do you find the information and useful tools. So not just any tool, but tools that are really useful to you. Um, most people follow projects or they find out about tools at conferences. The Bake Off's going on right now. I'm sure you can all agree how important something like that is, um, especially in um, a, a, a landscape that changes so often, right? Um, you, you really have to keep up on that. We've seen some other papers discuss that today. The, con the landscape is constantly changing. Um, online forums, word of mouth, blogs, social media, other, a lot of other was like, specific communities like the DPC. So other wasn't like totally different than some of these other, um, other answers. Again, with a survey, everyone's gonna interpret the question differently. Um, it, you try to control for that as best you can, but, but everyone's different, so. Um, we talked about the most valued feature of a digital preservation tool. Open source was, according to our respondents, the most highly uh, valued feature of a digital preservation tool. Um, you know, the interfaces obviously are very important. Um, being able to have control, which I think command line represents, is, is also there. The other answers were, I think they were very specific to uh, the type of material somebody had, depending on um, what tool they looked for. Um, and then some uh, paid commercial support was also um, noted as quite important and valued in the tools. So when we asked uh, on a, using a Likert scale, uh, it is extremely difficult to discover and choose suitable digital preservation tools. So this uh, really speaks to choice, how you make a decision. Um, most people, like there's only one person who strongly agreed, um, but most people did agree that it is difficult to make that choice. So I think that's really interesting because we don't know a lot about why people choose to use the tools they do. I could ask every one of you in this room, and that would be really interesting, but it would also take a really long time. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is sort of just 
a quick snapshot of that, but it is potentially fruitful to look further into something like that and how people make those decisions, um, particularly if we want to help people make that decision e more easily or more quickly. Uh, other uh, neutral was quite high, um, and disagree was uh, the, this, the third highest one there. So uh, next, I, I place an extremely high priority on finding digital preservation tools that are uh, sustainable with active community participation. So I will note that in this question, sustainable was not defined and community was not defined. So that is in and of itself a sort of a question mark there. So we're leaving it up to the, um, the respondent to decide what sustainable means and what community means. Um, but most people did agree that, uh, strongly agree, that um, sustainability and active community participation were important. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple slides. Uh, finally, just about registries, um, the students wanted to focus on copter and pronom. So we asked about copter and pronom and how important they were. Um, very important and extremely important, made up the bulk of responses. Neutral, uh, you know, came in third and then it sort of went down from there. So this would demonstrate or suggest that these registries are quite important in, um, you know, in discovery of these tools. So I want to talk about now about what these results might mean. Um, you know, that first part of the research question, what they might mean for practitioners, and the second part, what it might mean for educators or uh, education in general. So we, one of the results, participants cite difficulty at some level in discovering new tools. Um, so that suggests to me that we might want to make it easier, right? But the question is, how do we make it easier? Um, so obviously, we might want to dig into that a little bit more. If I start with a broad survey like this, maybe I want to do some qualitative research, talk to people, do interviews um, after. We found that there's a preference for open source versus proprietary. So that's interesting. But again, if I want to know why, I'd need to collect more data. Uh, then there was, what was really interesting is the concept of a community. So my question then is, what is a community and how are people defining that? And I know that that's been a recurrent theme coming up in some of the, the talks that we've had at this conference. But it is interesting. What do, what do people think of as a community? Do they think of it with boundaries that they maybe need to, are those boundaries permeable? Um, how do people join communities? So maybe not how do you find tools is the right question, but how do you find a community is a better question. Um, all of this, you know, you do one study and you have like, five more studies to do at the other end, so. Um, so that's really interesting. So I would challenge um, this idea of what community is and actually is it worth defining it um, to address w and would defining it answer some of our other problems. Um, finally, what I thought was really important uh, or was interesting was the importance of registries. So if registries are so important, is there a way that we can consolidate the information that is presented in registries so we have maybe case studies, and this case study from this conference five years ago that was super useful, but it sits in conference proceedings. So is there a way that we can sort of connect those case studies with Copter or, or any of the other, or, or Pronom or, or any of these other registries? Is there a way to consolidate information we have about tools, how people make decisions with tools? I can do that as an academic, like I could go do like this giant literature review and, and you know, try to assess, uh, you know, why people are doing it. But I, I do wonder if we can package the information in a different way, would this help people make those decisions or feel more confident in making those decisions or get them to the answer they want quicker. Um, the other sort of missing piece there was assessment. Uh, there isn't as much about assessment out there, um, but, we might think about how we could connect assessment. And again, I, I, I'm not saying to Pronom or, or the people who run Copter, like, go do this, because that's a lot of work, right? But it is a question of, is that something we might want to do? So finally, um, what does this mean for educators and education? So I do think hands-on activ activities, the, you know, the tool workshops that Kieran O'Leary runs for me and that, I, um, that we collaborate on, um, they're needed to engage students with tools. I don't think as, again, I don't think this is important about what tools are taught as figuring out that if you have trouble with the tool, you need to use your community. Um, how do you engage with that community? 
um, answering those type of questions, but also the ambiguity and the sort of uncomfortableness that sometimes exists when using tools. Um, I mean, in doing this in, for eight years, I mean, I've seen a variety of emotions when people are trying to use tools and cannot get them to work. And we do this in the classroom so that people, I can say, it's okay. You're not getting graded on how well you can make this tool work. It's about experimenting and trying. Um, I do get a lot of students who have a lot of anxiety about using technology in this way. Um, particularly, like, I come in the first day, I'm like, we're doing Python, and, and some of them just leave. <laughs> because they're like, I did not sign up for this. I wanted to do history. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Um, so, you know, in Ireland, we don't have this sort of liberal arts background like they would in the U.S. where there's a lot of different classes that somebody would have tried out. They, they focus quite early on. So if they've only done history or they've only done humanities and suddenly I'm like, Python, they're, they're, there's a lot of anxiety there. So I, I always think about how I can assuage that so we can move beyond that so we can get to, to what we need to learn. Um, so also... Uh, I think the community is such an important part of learning about digital preservation that it really needs more attention. And, and I certainly will be taking that on board as to how I design lessons um, in the future. Okay, all done, thank you. Thank you very much, that was really uh, fascinating. Uh, so do we have any questions? There's a question there from Paul. Thanks so much for this, Sam. But Paul, Paul Wheatley, DPC, one of the originators with Andy of the Copter Registry. Um, yeah, that's fantastic work. It's brilliant to see. Um, one of the things that came out of our registries workshop on uh, Monday was that a lot of our registries are, are held together with a bit of spare time from one or two people. That, you know, there's a crisis in funding in of our registries and um, just keeping Copter going is difficult enough without actually being able to stop and evaluate it and think about how effective it is and what else we can be doing. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's going to be really useful. Um, you talked about the sort of consolidation of those case studies and all that other information and there is a space for that in Copter, right? Um, but it comes down to having enough time from the community to contribute all those things. Um, should, it, should, should it come down to individuals to do that? Um, what I think you were almost hinting at is perhaps that's a role for um, perhaps iPress, okay? So, you know, we have these fantastic meetings, we talk about all these things, we share all this information, and then it's buried away in one PDF file of all the individual, you know, all the individual talks and papers. Um, we should be making that accessible. We should be following some of the things we say in our conferences and making that data findable and discoverable. So maybe there's a way that we can work, as Copter, we can work with iPress to make some of that information more usable and accessible. But thank you very much, Amber. Can, can, okay, can I here? Yeah, and, and this is where I, th I wonder if further defining the concept of community is useful. So we can all say, community is important, we love community, I'm a member of this community, but it's not super tangible. So if it's, is it, what would happen if we said a community means you're gonna contribute? Um, and not just say contribute like, yay, contribute, but like in the end, but like you're gonna make it your effort to contribute one hour of your time a year or something like that or, or, and, and figure out recognition in a way to do that, because a lot of that is unpaid labor, um, and it's voluntary, and is there a way that we can harness that and make it more tangible so we can see the results that I, I think will be re useful and that we really want? Andy has a question. With Copter and, um, and uh, things like that, and one thing I looked at is, um, is um, extracting the contributions, tracking who's done edits and publicizing that. But that started to feel a bit icky because it turned, it's too gamey and, and certain voices, hello you and hello me, uh, dominate some of these forums without really meaning to just because we're trying to be helpful, we, but we don't. So I think it's, imp yes, I think we should, but it, um, I tried simple measures and it's too simple. It needs to be something that brings people in, not kind of, oh, Andy will answer that if I put it on there. Because I felt like, did you, I think we had a conversation about this, didn't we? We felt like we were dominating some of these uh, forums a bit too much uh, and we wanted to kind of give 
bring other voices in, so it's difficult. And if we can get IPRES um, to support it on a more broad base, that would, that would function well. Yeah, measurement may or may not be the answer. I think a lot of different communities, like I think Yahoo questions and answers like 20 years ago were trying the measurement, right? So like we have a history of maybe looking at other communities and how measurement worked for them. And maybe measurement's not the answer. So, I don't know. It sounds like there's a research project in there for yeah. someone, if we can get yeah. anyone there's interested. There's always more research to be done. I think we also have a question from the uh, online audience. So it's more of a comment than a question, but I think it um, speaks to what you're saying towards the end and how head students are quite hesitant to, to adopt new tools. So E. Walker says that there's a problem with how archival slash information programs are sold to students versus the reality, and that they, they encounter this every day in their work. Yes, I agree. Um, and I could have, like, I could give another talk right now on that for like an hour, uh, which I won't do, don't worry. Um, <laughs> you can talk to me about it if you want. But it is, I mean, it, it, it is actually, it can be really difficult, right? Because you, I'm really lucky that Kieran works with me. Um, and that we have a good relationship because I can't do what he does and he can't and he doesn't can't and doesn't want to do what I do um, But when you're working in a practical field it, But you're the you're, I'm getting assessed as an academic, right? So I have to be an academic But I know that to teach I need to be up to date with things So it's ha I can't do two jobs. So it's it, it's really difficult um, I did read an academic paper recently about how there needs to be like like how in medicine, you know, in medicine, you can go off and see patients or whatever and have this practical element. And medicine's really good about saying we want to be evaluated in that way, like in academia. I, I think that's a little bit harder when you're a smaller field. Like if, if I want to go say, I'm going to go on sabbatical and I'm going to spend my sabbatical relearning tools and I'm going to be like, I'm going to be an archivist again and, and go work in a, in a repository and as a, you know, in digital preservation. Uh, you know, my, my head of school would say to me, like, okay, fund yourself for six months and get two papers to me at the end of it and you can do whatever you want. But, like, there's, there's that element there. So it's this, I 100% agree that we need to think more about how we provide education for digital preservation. I actually had a question. Um, you were talking about education and things you had for students at the end and for educators. I'm really interested... Could you give us some tips and tricks for practitioners? Because, I mean, I'm thinking already at me, but especially at early career uh, practitioners who, just like the students, maybe have no idea. And I have to say, even in my case, as we we're discussing, not a lot of time to uh, go looking for things. A lot of times, I have to admit, if I find something in an IPRES paper, it's too long to read, so I just like read a bit the abstract, go to the conclusions, and I'm like, maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure, I'm gonna, so my go-to is Twitter. <laughs> I go, ask people, usually I get really useful uh, answers, but I'm not sure if that's really the best way to go about it. So when Karen teaches our tools workshops, he says go to Twitter, yeah. I mean, if you need an answer, yeah. I mean, if, especially a quick one, yeah. And have a longer conversation if you need to or if you want to in, in another space. But to just figure things out, I, I think social media is perfectly fine. Um, it, you know, yeah, definitely. My only problem is that coming to a conference like this, which are peer reviewed, so you have also a lot more really academic content coming in. And a lot of times I had the impression that, okay, you have the really nice research results, but I cannot really apply them in my day-to-day -day job. So. How do we bridge that gap? How do we like, get the research results to come into our day-to-day -day, uh, digital preservation work? I think that was Andrew's paper, right? <laughs> the theory of practice? That's, I, 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 so w what I would like to present to the future IPRES is, is things, uh, there's a th concept called Wardley maps, which deals with this quite well, or explores some of the issues. So the thing is, if the re research and like um, business as usual industrialization are miles apart. And you need to fund the middle bit where you transition across that long divide from being something which is an academic did once to something that's reproducible, something which is a product, and then something which maybe will one day become a commodity. 
and I'm afraid it, we don't fund that well as a field. This was a thing Frank just used to uh, often play this role. And I've wor I also I worked on, in my previous life, in physics, I worked at a place called Edinburgh Parallel Computing Company, and they explicitly did what they called technology transfer projects. And that was, again, explicitly addressing this middle bit of, OK, you did a great project, that's great. How are we going to fund its transition into something people can reuse? So I'm afraid, I mean, as I say this all the time, the answer's more money, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's more money, but it's focused in the right places. And, and that... that observe, I mean, I see in my role, observing relevant research and trying to find bits I can pull in is part of my job, but not everyone's in the position like me able to do that, and so it's finding ways of funding that transition is my opinion on that. <laughs> I would say, I, I think that's true. I, I, I would note that, like, I, in some of my other projects, I've worked with computer scientists, and if you work on a big European Research Council grant that's more computer science based, there will be a, te a technology transfer component. And like it's part of the evaluation, you need to do it. But if you work more and more of the you know, humanities cultural heritage space, there's no evaluation for that. I mean, I won't say there's no, because I mean, people can evaluate that. An evaluator could evaluate that if they want to, but it's not as, it's not as um, transparent that you're going to be assessed on your technology mm. transfer. Mm. I think we're going to keep some more questions for because we still have the final Q and A. And thank you again very much, Amber. Thank you.